Welcome. Thanks for viewing our weekly sermon. I'm Pastor Malone, and we pray that this message be a blessing to you and help you grow closer to Jesus. If you'd like to know more about having a personal relationship with Jesus or to connect with us as a church, please visit westacres.org. Thanks again, and God bless. Thank you, Rob and choir, for leading us. And it's already been such a very special morning. Uh, just beginning with baptism, that is so special. I'm grateful for uh, the message that's already been proclaimed uh, through baptism, through that ordinance. Church, while the choir is being seated, before we come to uh, the word this morning, before I preach the message, I just want to address something. Uh, that's been in the news and the headlines uh, this week, and that is what's going on within the Southern Baptist Convention. I just feel like I could not preach the word this morning uh, without addressing this. Uh, but as you may know, at our 2021 annual meeting, uh, the Southern Baptist Convention uh, commissioned a task force to investigate uh, abuse uh, within our convention, and that uh, covers churches all across our nation. Uh, but also allegations with leadership and mishandling of abuse. If you don't know already, and I encourage you, please don't look into this during the service. This time is for the Lord. Um, that report was released last Sunday, and it's just been heartbreaking and saddening uh, to read the details within that report. Our hearts break, first and foremost, for the victims, also known as survivors, their families, their churches, uh, but we are also saddened by the damage and the hurt it has done uh, to the testimony of Jesus Christ. And we've seen many uh, key leaders also named in that report. And that breaks our heart as well. Because any time a shepherd uh, falls, messes up, that sin doesn't just affect them. It affects so many others. So I want to let you know that as your pastor, our staff, the leadership of this church is fully aware of that report. But I also want to let you know that West Acres Baptist Church is intentional and proactive in preventing such things from ever happening in this place. Uh, we desire to have a safe place of worship. That's why we put a priority on security, uh, but we also make it a priority uh, to have our children and students safe. We utilize training. It's called Ministry Safe. You can find out more information about that online. We do background checks. And through that training, we have become aware of so many things to be looking for, uh, but we've also become aware of how to handle such things if it ever happened here. And God forbid if abuse ever happened at West Acres Baptist Church, I just want to assure you that it will be handled properly, that we would do the proper reportings to law enforcement, and that we would take all the proper steps that are needed. I share that with you today uh, before we come to the Word because we are a Southern Baptist church. Uh, we are a part of the Southern Baptist Convention. We are in cooperation with all the Southern Baptist churches located across North America and beyond. Um, for this purpose, and you've probably heard this, we are better together. We are better together, especially when it comes to missions and fulfilling the Great Commission. When you have thousands of churches coming together, we can do so much more together for Jesus and going to the nations, fulfilling the Great Commission, than being an isolated church on an island. So I want to just say that we are better together. But here's the thing, and I learned this in the military. Whenever you're a part of a group, whenever you're a part of a team, when one person hurts, the whole group hurts. So I want to say this today. There are many churches that have been directly affected uh, by the contents of that report. And they are hurting. And we hurt with them. We hurt with the victims. We hurt with the churches as well. So I want to ask that you please be praying for these things. Be praying for the survivors. Be praying for the churches that are affected. Be praying for the leadership of the Southern Baptist Convention as they move forward and respond in the proper way from the findings of this report. And at this time, I want you to join me as we pray for these things. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we come to you today, and Lord, we're, we're all here because of this thing called sin. It's a messy business. And Lord, we can't deny that sin happens uh, within our own lives, but also within our churches, 
within our denomination. Father, we pray for forgiveness. We pray for repentance. Lord, we pray for healing. We pray for restoration. God, we pray for the leaders of our our Southern Baptist Convention. God, I pray you'll raise up godly men, men of integrity, Lord, that will know how to handle things of such magnitude. We give these things to you. Father, we also pray for all of those who were affected by abuse, the individuals, but also all the people within their lives. We pray that you bring healing that only you can bring through your son, Jesus Christ. Father, I pray over these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, church. At this time, I want to invite you to turn with me in the scriptures to 2 Samuel chapter 9. 2 Samuel chapter 9. We're going to be in verses 1 through 13 today. Uh, you might be familiar with this story. It's one of my favorites. It's not just a story. It's, it's a true story. But 2 Samuel chapter 9, verses 1 through 13. If you don't have a Bible, uh, we do have those in the pew available for you. If you don't have a Bible at all, take that home with you today. It now belongs to you. But once you've found your place, please stand with me as we honor the reading of God's Word. This takes place after David has been on the run from Saul. He's been anointed king for many, many years, but now he's on the throne. It takes place, chapter 9. David said, Is there still anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba, and they called him to David. And the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, I am your servant. And the king said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God to him? Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan. He is crippled in his feet. The king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, He is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, at Lodabar. And King David sent and brought him from the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, at Lodabar. And Mephibosheth, everybody try to say that word, Mephibosheth, that name. I don't know if my wife will let us use that one. Um, And Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, fell on his face, and paid homage. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold, I am your servant. And David said to him, Do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan. And I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your father, who we know is his grandfather. And you shall eat at my table always. And he paid homage and said, What is your servant that you should show regard for a dead dog such as I? Then the king called Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, All that belong to Saul and all to his house, I have given to your master's grandson. And you and your sons and your servants shall till the land for him and shall bring in the produce that your master's grandson may have bread to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to the king, According to all that my lord the king commands his servants, so will your servant do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a son whose name was Micah, Micah. And all who lived in Ziba's house became Mephibosheth's servants. So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, for he ate always at the king's table. Now he was lame in both of his feet. Let us pray. Father God, I pray you please just speak to us now through your word. Lord, we are here to listen. I pray you open our eyes, open our ears. Um, Lord, open our hearts. Father, if there's anyone here today that uh, doesn't know the good news of your son, Jesus Christ, Lord, I pray that, Lord, uh, that it will come known to them today through this message. Lord, not just known, but I pray that they will respond in faith and trust. Father, we love you, and we ask your blessings on this word. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Today's a very special day because we, uh, it is, of course, Memorial Day weekend. But it's also special because we're going to be coming to, to celebrate a memorial. That's the Lord's table. We're going to be coming together as a church body. 
You know, the Lord's table uh, is a memorial. It is a time of reflection. It is a time for remembrance. Jesus Christ said himself when he instituted the Lord's Supper, he said, do this in remembrance of me. He told us to do it in remembrance of me. The Lord's Supper reminds us of Jesus, but it specifically reminds us of his death. And through the supper, we're also reminded of how he died. How did Jesus die? He died brutally on a cross. There's one question to ask how he died, but here's one that's really important. Why did he die? He died for our sin. He died for my sin, your sin, the sins of all the world. He died as our substitute. While this meal is a memorial, uh, is also a symbol. You ever thought about this? That this meal is a symbol of reconciliation with God. The thought of breaking bread. You ever thought about that? What the purpose of breaking bread with another person? Breaking bread or or having a meal with someone uh, usually symbolizes peace and fellowship. Maybe you've been at odds with somebody. You've seen it in a story. You've seen it in another situation where two people have been at odds, but they come to full uh, reconciliation. They not only become friends, but sometimes we see those people doing what? Coming together and breaking bread. We see in our own culture today that very thing. Uh, But this was especially uh, true in the ancient Near East, in the biblical times. So when believers, we come to the king's table for the Lord's Supper, we're reminded of reconciliation. We're reminded that we were once enemies with God. But not anymore. Because of his son, Jesus Christ, you know what God says? Let's have a meal. Let's have a meal. He gives us this meal for now. And we have, you read the book of Revelation, there's going to be a great meal. You better, uh, I don't know if, if we'll... Get bigger waste then, but it's going to be really, really good. So before we come to the king's table today, I want to talk about another king's table, and that is King David. Uh, The title of this passage is The Place at the King's Table. Now, I want you to know this. This is a true story. This really happened. This is not an allegory. But today, I want to show you some parallels from this story, some parallels between us today and Mephibosheth, and some parallels between King David and King Jesus. To begin, let's look at Mephibosheth. Number one, Mephibosheth is a picture of us sinners. Why do I say that? As Mephibosheth was crippled, we too are crippled. We're crippled by sin. We're crippled by sin. As the text indicates, Mephibosheth, I'm going to mess, that, mess up somewhere with that name. It's a lot of syllables. Uh, he was crippled. We see that in verses 3 through 13. He was lame in both of his feet. But he wasn't born this way. He wasn't born this way. If you were to go back a little bit to 2 Samuel chapter 4, verse 4, after Saul and Jonathan had been killed, uh, the, the house of Saul, the house of Jonathan, it was all chaos. And it said a nurse uh, fled, and while she was fleeing in her haste, Mephibosheth fell and became lame as a five-year-old child. Mephibosheth was crippled physically by a fall. He could not walk. But we too are crippled. We're not crippled physically, per se, but we are crippled spiritually. And we're also crippled spiritually by a fall, by the fall of Adam. And we have a sinful nature that has been inherited uh, by the first man, Adam. Uh, But we have really good experience at sin, too. We have all sinned. Every single person except Jesus has sinned. And because of our sinfulness, we can't walk in a way that pleases the world. In fact, Ephesians chapter 2 tells us this. We walk in the course of this world. And and because of that, we were dead in our trespasses. Uh, We can't walk in God's way. We walk our way. Uh, We go astray. We do things our own way. And guess what our walk is? It's crooked. It is crooked. As much as we may try to walk straight, as much as we may try to fix things in our own power, it cannot be done. We are crippled by our sin, which makes the second parallel uh, very evident today. That's number two. We are enemies of the king. 
We are enemies of the king. At this point in the story, David is now king. He has been on the run from Saul. If you go through First uh, and Second Samuel, he has been running for his life. It always makes me think of the, the movie, The Fugitive. I wasn't around for the TV show, okay? But the movie with Harrison Ford. What's Harrison Ford doing in that movie? He is running for his life, literally. And that's what King David was doing from Saul. But guess what? No more running. No more running. Saul is dead. And in this time in history, it was customary. It was even justifiable to execute anyone uh, that was a threat to the throne. This included anybody that was a part of the family of the, uh, the preceding dynasty, the former dynasty. So this included anybody related to Saul and his offspring. This included Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth was deemed an enemy to, to King David because of his relation to Saul. Likewise, we are enemies of a king. We are enemies of God. Not because, well, I guess we are related uh, because of who we're related to. But we're also enemies because of our own sin. Our sin deems us an enemy of God. It separates us. It alienates us. Listen to this, folks. I don't care what the culture tries to teach you. God cannot turn a blind eye to sin. He can't ignore it. He can't watch sin, 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 sin. Say, okay, that's okay. It doesn't work that way. God, yes, He is perfect in His love, but anyone that studied the Bible long enough also knows that He is perfect in His justice. He's perfect in holiness. He has to have the, the fact that He's perfect in holiness and perfect in justice means He has to have the perfect reaction to sin. That means there must be punishment. There is a punishment, and it's called death. And it's not just a punishment, but it's something we earn for the wages of sin is death. You want to hear some good news, though? You don't have to die. You, you don't have to have that spiritual death. And we are spiritually dead. Um, but Jesus came and took death and punishment on the cross. He, he came and took uh, God's wrath for us. He took condemnation on the cross. So we wouldn't have to probably reading your Bibles, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Why is that? Because He took all of it. He took all of it. A third parallel is this. We must humble ourselves and recognize who we really are. And when David summoned Mephibosheth, you can only imagine what was going through Mephibosheth's mind. Mephibosheth, uh, what was going through his mind? Well, he knew the custom of the day. He knew that he was related to Saul. He knew that he would be deemed a threat to the kingdom. You can only imagine what was going through his mind. But here's, the thing, here's some history lesson for you. Who was Mephibosheth's dad? Jonathan. Who was Jonathan? David's best friend. Now, Jonathan's dad was King Saul. King Saul wanted David dead. So here's the question. Did Mephibosheth know David? According to Jonathan, as a friend, or did he know da or did he know David according to Saul, an enemy? We don't know what was going through his head, but death was certainly a possibility. And although he was crippled, where he, he would not have a right to the throne, the text tells us in verse twelve that he had a son. So what does that mean? Mephibosheth, he, he could be like, Well, I can't be king, but you better believe my boy can. My boy can. He could be a champion for the throne of Saul which deemed him even more of a threat. Let's take a look at Mephibosheth's actions after he's brought there. After all, he can't walk. I don't know if they had wheelchairs. I don't know what they had then, crutches. Um, but he's lame in his feet. Let's notice how he entered the king's presence in verse 6. Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David, fell on his face, and paid homage. His actions. And he goes on to say, Behold, I am your servant. His actions are out of respect and honor to the king. Secondly, notice how he responds to David. So he comes to David. David has not killed him. David has not said, away with this man, off with his head. Uh, what does David do? If, he pours blessings on this man. He's greeted with grace and generosity. Look how he responds in verse 8. And he paid homage and said, what is your servant 
that you should show regard for a dead dog such as I. He doesn't refer to himself as a prince. A Mephibosheth is not, he doesn't have the mentality, he says, about time you came and got me. He goes, I've been waiting on this call. He, he doesn't say that. He doesn't refer to himself as the prince. He doesn't refer to himself, I'm Jonathan's son. He doesn't refer to himself as the grandson of the king. He refers to himself as a dead dog. A dead dog in this time was considered despicable and useless. Now, don't miss this. He's not saying this because he's crippled. He's not saying this because he's crippled. After all, you can see other instances in the Old Testament where people called themselves a dead dog. In fact, it was while David was on the run from Saul, I believe he, he cut a part of Saul's robe off and, and, and shared with Saul, I, I, I had a chance to kill you today, but I haven't. But later on, he says this. Uh, he says in 1 Samuel 24, verse 14, After whom has the king of Israel come out? After whom do you pursue? After a dead dog? After a flea? David himself, who was anointed king, calls himself a dead dog. He even goes on to say, I'm a flea. Mephibosheth, David, recognizing his place before the king. He's saying this, I'm a nobody. I'm a nobody. I'm at the bottom of the ladder. Why would you want me, a dead dog, to sit at your table? I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. Mephibosheth is humbling himself. He's recognizing he doesn't deserve any of this. He doesn't deserve any of the things David has just told him he's going to receive. Can I say this? One reason people don't come in faith and trust in Jesus Christ is because they don't recognize who they really are. They think they are okay. They think they are good. They think, man, I'm, I'm okay. They don't recognize that they're not okay. They don't recognize that they are a sinner. They don't recognize that they are doomed uh, with an eternity of going to hell. They don't recognize their need for mercy and grace. Folks, when you encounter the Lord Jesus and you recognize who he really is, you humble yourself before the king. When you hear the gospel of what's being presented, eternity, forgiveness, salvation, all those things, you don't just say, I'm good. No, you humble yourself. You respond a lot like Peter in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 5, verse 8. After Peter had seen this great catch of fish, what did he do? He fell down. He said, depart from me. I am a sinful man, O Lord. When you recognize who Jesus really is, you humble yourself. You realize, I have nothing good within me. I have no righteousness. I am dirty. Like Isaiah, I am a man of unclean lips. That's what Jesus called being poor in spirit. If you were to go to the Beatitudes, Matthew chapter 5, I don't have this on the screen, but it, Jesus, the very first thing, the very first message he preached on the Sermon on the Mount was this. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom. Now what does it mean to be poor in spirit? Being poor in spirit means a person recognizes they have nothing to bring to the table for their salvation. Uh, they recognize that they are spiritually bankrupt. They come into God's presence and they recognize, I don't know why on earth you would save me. I am not worthy of this. But Jesus says, blessed are those people. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Uh, they, they're a lot like that song we sing from time to time. Nothing in my hands I bring simply to the cross. I cling. Poor in spirit. As sinners, we recognize with Mephibosheth in this story, we are crippled by sin. We are enemies because of our sin. And when we come to realize those two things, we got to recognize that we must humble ourselves before the Lord. So that's a, that's a picture of Mephibosheth paints for us. But let's look at King David and how he paints a picture for King Jesus. Number two, King David is a picture of King Jesus. First off, what does King Jesus do and what did King David do? The king initiates kindness. Mephibosheth does not come seeking the king. Uh, we don't read this story saying, hey, this crippled man's at the front door, David. What you want to do with him? No, you don't read about that. Uh, you read the story of this. You read of a king that could be doing so much other thing, could be enjoying his kingdom, could be just chilling out, but he's walking around saying, is there anybody left in the house of Saul that I could show kindness to for the sake of Jonathan? David initiates this kindness. 
King David is just like King Jesus. King Jesus does the same thing from us. He makes the first move. He was in perfect communion with the Father and the Holy Spirit in heaven. Yeah, what does Scripture say? God sent him to seek the lost and to save us. Salvation is not a result of our kindness, but is a reality of God's kindness. Jesus came to us. We didn't go to him. Romans 5, 8. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It doesn't say, but God shows his love for us while we're trying to get things better, trying to fix things, trying to make it right, trying to do these, these steps to get holier and holier and holier. No, it says he came to us in the filthiness of our sin. While we were still sinners, the king left heaven to show his kindness to you and me. 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. Uh, 1 John chapter 4, verse 19. We love because he first loved loved us he started it he took the initiative he made the first move secondly let's look at what the king does the king keeps his promises the king keeps his promises why is David concerned in showing kindness uh, to the house of Saul and Jonathan why is he concerned with these things well, that would require us to go back, and I don't have time for that. But 1 Samuel, there's two separate accounts where David makes a promise to both Jonathan and both to Saul. He promises Jonathan that I will always remember your house. I will always show kindness to you. And then in that very encounter where he calls himself a dead dog with Saul earlier, uh, Saul says, promise me, David, you're going to be a way better king than me. Promise me that you will not cut off my offspring from the house, from the face of this earth. He made two separate promises to these men. But what's David been going through during this time? He's been on the run. He hasn't been living in a palace. He's been living in caves. He's been acting crazy, trying not to get killed. He's been doing all sorts of things, desperately just to live another day. In fact, what's interesting about this story is that this didn't just take place a couple weeks before. He didn't make this promise about a week ago. Scholars think he made this promise about a decade or maybe even two decades before this day came. You know what that teaches us? David was a man that kept his word. Are we a people that keep our word? Are we a people that when we make a commitment, I think of a commitment of marriage, I think of a commitment you make when you join a local church, do we, do we keep our word? I don't care if a decade passes, I don't care if two decades pass. You remember the words you kept, and you keep it. David was a man after God's own heart. Why is that? Because God keeps his word. God keeps his word. God promised a king and a savior. He promised a Messiah. He gave us one. Jesus. He promised salvation. He promised forgiveness of sins. He made it possible through the cross. Our God keeps his promises. He promises to be with us always, even to the end of the age. But if you read on in Scripture, guess what else He promises? He promises us eternity. So if you die today, you'll, you put your faith and trust in Him, you know exactly where you will be. But if we're sticking around for more, He promises He's going to return. He's got a pretty good track record of keeping His promises. Our God keeps His promises. Keeps His word. Finally, number three, the King's grace is amazing. In Mephibosheth's mind, he was a dead dog. When he came and put his face before the king, he was probably expecting death. Expecting death. He was probably expecting King David to say, away with this man. Away with this dead dog. Away with this scum. Away with this threat. Execute this man. But when he bows down before David with his face to the earth, does he hear any of those words? He hears these words. Mephibosheth, Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth's probably thinking, he knows my name. He knows my, how does he know me? He knows who I am. He says my name. And it doesn't stop there. Look at verse 7. David says to him, do not fear. Do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan. And I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your father, grandfather. And you shall eat at my table. Always. 
And it's a beautiful picture. And it's a beautiful picture. It's a lot like when the angels came at the time of Jesus' birth. What did they say? Do not fear. I come to you with good news. I come to you with good news. Instead of death, Mephibosheth is showered in grace. He, he's told he'll be shown kindness for the sake of his father. Don't miss that. Mephibosheth doesn't earn this favor. He, he doesn't do anything to, to deserve it. He is given all these blessings that we're going to go through in a little bit. Why? Because of the sake of Jonathan. Folks, when it comes to us sinners, we are showered with grace so much. I'm going to go through this in a little bit. Not because of anything we've done. But everything because of what he has done for us. It is done by Jesus, but it's also done by the sake of Jesus. We are given salvation freely because of him. We are given kindness because of God's covenant. God promises these things. He keeps his word. Mephibosheth's not only saved from death. He's restored all the property that belonged to Saul. That sounds pretty good. Who was Saul? King Saul. The first king. This amount of property, there's no telling how much it was all worth that David says, I'm giving it all to you. I'm not only going to give you all this, Mephibosheth, but I'm going to give you a management team. I'm going to give you a staff that's going to take care of everything. Gives him all those things, but then he says, but guess what? You don't even have to worry about food, though, brother. You're going to be sitting at my table. You're going to be sitting at my table. He will be treated like a son. This passage came to me, actually came to me this morning. There's another passage of Jonathan talking to David. Jonathan was David's best friend. Jonathan was the son of Saul. This man was in a pretty tough position. You ever thought about that? Your best friend, but your dad wants to kill you? Your friend? 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 17. I don't have this on the screen. Jonathan is helping David get out of Dodge. But he says this. Jonathan said to David, You shall be king of Israel, and I will be next to you. And my father knows all these things. It's really special. I just wanted to point this out. Jonathan said, I will be next to you. What does that mean? I'm going to be at your table, David. Jonathan didn't live to see that day. He didn't live to see that day. But David says to Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, you're going to sit at my table. You're going to sit at my table. Such a special, special bond. I can't help but to think even though Mephibosheth had this disability, when, when David looked at Mephib, that's what I'm going to call him, that's what James calls David Nowling. That's a nickname for David Nowling. When David looked at Mephib, he saw Jonathan. Church, you want to know something beautiful about the gospel? Through salvation, through justification, righteousness, being clothed, and everything that God has given us, when God looks at us, he doesn't see us. He sees his son. It's a beautiful picture of the gospel, a beautiful picture of God's grace to his children. God not only saves us, but he showers us with so much more. And I've talked about this from time to time that he not only says you're forgiven, but he says no hell. He not only says no hell, but he says heaven. He not only says, hey, you're saved from these things. I'm going to give you my Holy Spirit. Now he stops there. I would have shaken his hand there. Deal, Lord. He calls us sons and daughters. Not only saves us from all those things that we deserve, but he says, I'm going to give you eternity in the greatest land of all. Heaven. Gives us all of those things. He gives us a place at his table. This is a rehearsal, folks. This is a rehearsal of what we're doing today. We are coming to the king's table. This is such a special, special honor. If you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are born again, you have a place at this table. But this is just a, a preview. 
Just a preview. I heard a commentator talk about this. I never thought about it, but he complained. He's like, why are these cups so small? And I just inhaled this bread. What, what is the deal? What kind of supper is this? It's just a taste. It's just a taste. Because the book of Revelation, where you read about the marriage supper of the Lamb, it's going to be the greatest ever. It's going to be the greatest ever. We're going to eat, okay? We're going to eat, but the food's not just going to be good. The company's going to be good. We're going to be at a table full of people, no more sin. But we're also going to be at the table with the king. So church, I just want to say this today. God has a place for you at his table. Non-believer, someone that's never put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. You realize who, who he really is. And you're starting to realize now who you really are. I want to tell you this. He has a place for you at the table. But he calls you to repent of your sins. He calls you to put your faith and trust in his son Jesus for salvation. That's it. And you have a place at his table. Will you accept his invitation? Let's pray.